Hi guys, it's Miss Freeman again, and today I'd like to start something called First Chapter Friday. So each Friday I'll read you the first chapter of one of our new books. Today, our first chapter Friday will be this book called Rick. This is by Alex Gino, who is the author of the book called George. Um, and this follows a very similar theme to the book George. It's about a boy who doesn't really know where he fits in. He doesn't know if he likes boys or girls. Um, but he sees that other kids, other people are very sure of themselves. So he joins this club where he feels like he can belong and where he can find his own identity. So we're gonna read the first chapter of this book today. When I'm all done, you can decide if you enjoyed it, if you'd like to read it, and if you'd like to check it out from our library. If you would, just go ahead in the book request, type in your name, your teacher's name, the hour and day you have language arts, the title and author, Rick by Alex Gino, and I will bring it to you on your library day. So let's get started. We're just gonna read the first chapter of this book, again, called Rick. Here we go. Chapter one, Rick Ramsey, right hand man. Rick Ramsey sat on his bedroom floor on the last day before middle school, spinning quarters. He had just cleaned his room on his parents' insistence that he start the school year fresh, so the floor was bare except for the rug that looked like a baseball. The whole room was baseball themed, from the time that mom and dad had decided to redecorate just as he signed up for baseball in third grade. Baseball had only lasted eight weeks, but the wallpaper remained. He chose an especially shiny coin, balanced it between his left thumb and right middle finger, and set it spinning. He picked up a second and then a third, getting them going as the first tipped from a round and round spin to an up and down wobble that led to a lie down flat with a final buzz. His all time record was seven quarters moving at once and that was cutting it close. Most of the time he could do five. It was harder than it looked. If you didn't give them just the right flick, the coins fell down after a turn or two or spun under the bed. You had to move fast once the first one was going. Rick kept spinning until the quarters were scattered around him. Then he scooped them up and began again. This time he put a shiny coin into each hand and spun them both at the same time. The quarter on the right set to dancing on end while the one on the left started wobbling right away. At least it didn't fall down immediately. When he started practicing sim simultaneous spins, his right hand produced nothing but wobblers and his left hand would have gotten more movement by dropping the coin on the table with a flop. He jumped up when Dad honked the car horn. The car was packed and Dad was ready to drive Rick's sister, Diane, to her first year of college. Rick dumped the pile of quarters back into their jar and bounded down the stairs and out to the driveway to say goodbye. I hope you don't mind that I'm not joining you, Mom said, putting her arm around Diane's shoulder. I told you, it's fine. Dad's just going to drop me off with my stuff and then turn right around to go home. There's no room for you anyway. And Rick was right. The back seat and trunk were filled with crates and bags. But we took Thomas out for dinner when he started college. I'm not Thomas. Besides, I'm only going an hour away. I'll visit all the time. I'll still miss you, said Mom. I'll miss you too, said Diane, although it were a challenge. They entangled in a mess of long, straight black hair and pale pink limbs. Dad joined in with his thicker, hairier arms and wavy light brown hair and called Rick into the family huddle. Rick had dad's hair and mom's skin tone, but sometimes, like most kids, he wondered where he'd come from. Rick and Diane exchanged a series of high fives and high tens before Diane enveloped him in, his arm, in her arms. Promise you won't grow up on me while I'm gone. Uh. Rick had no plans of growing up before her first visit home in three weeks, but it seemed like a weird thing to promise. Promise me. Diane. Dad put a heavy hand on Rick's shoulder. Rick's about to start middle school. Whole new worlds are opening up for him. Girls, or boys, added mom. Point is, the two of you are on new journeys and we're proud of both of you. Rick really didn't think there was much of a comparison. There would be plenty of kids at middle school he'd known for years, especially his best friend Jeff. Girls or boys were nothing new. Changing classes sounded like fun, but he didn't get to pick them the way Diane did. And at the end of every day, he would still be coming home to the same house one less person in it. Mom embraced Dad and said, Drive safe, Robbie. Always, said Dad, kissing Mom on the lips. Okay, give your mom one more hug, Diane, and let's get out of here. Rick and Mom waved as the car drove away. 
Neither of them moved from the sidewalk until it had reached a light three blocks down and turned out of sight. Well, two down, one to go, I guess, said Mom with a smile propped on her face. Hey, Mom, is it okay if I go to Jeff's? Jeff had, had instant message the night before that he'd gotten the new bar fight 3000 and that Rick should come over. And leave me with a quiet home to take a nap in, said Mom. By all means, my little dove, just be home for dinner by seven. And come give your mom a bird a hug before you go. Rick leaned over and Mom kissed him on the forehead. It felt kind of wet, but he didn't rub it off. He grabbed his bike out of the shed and puddled over to Jeff's place. Rick and Jeff had been best friends since the second week of third grade, when Rick had done an impression of Mrs. Fields, the old woman who volunteered in the lunchroom, and Jeff had laughed so hard that milk came out of his nose. Neither of them had known that that could really happen, and it made them laugh even harder. Rick hadn't had a whole lot of friends, and Jeff was new, and soon they were a molecule. Jeff and Rick, Rick liked being part of a molecule. That spring, when Rick signed up for baseball, Jeff signed up too. Two months later, when Rick admitted he was having a terrible time, Jeff quit right alongside him. And when Dad told Rick it was important to take out a challenge, Jeff had pointed out that video games were just as challenging as physical sports and just as good for your hand-eye coordination with none of the risk of being hit by a flying lump of rubber, yarn, and cowhide. Sometimes Jeff didn't think before he spoke or before he acted, especially when he didn't like something. But Jeff liked hanging out with Rick, and Rick liked hanging out with Jeff, and sometimes that was all you needed to be best friends. Jeff's little green two-story house had a steeply sloped red attic that looked like the letter A and a pair of pink rose bushes on the front door. Jeff's mom, Stacy, met Rick at the door and welcomed him in. She was tall like Jeff with thick lines on her face and her hair was back in a messy bun. She wore black yoga pants and a gray tank top with faded writing that said, I've already done my good deed for the day. Try again tomorrow. Come on up, Jeff called from upstairs. You heard him. Go do your thing, Stacy said with an offhand wave. Rick ran up the wide first flight and climbed more slowly as the stairs narrowed and turned in on themselves. Jeff's room was the entire attic, so it was big, but the ceiling sloped down so you could only stand up in the middle of the room. Old boxes and suitcases ran along the two long but low walls. A mattress of messy black sheets and a single pillow took up one corner. A warm wooden bur bureau with the top drawer pulled out and sitting on the floor was centered on the third wall below a round window that opened outward. The fourth wall was mostly the staircase. A flat screen TV sat on the floor in the middle of the room flanked with stacks of video games and in front of two black leather beanbag chairs. Jeff was already in one of the beanbag chairs, controller in hand and screen paused. His face was peachy white with a small white scar on his forehead and short brown hair stuck up like loose spikes. He wore red basketball shorts and a black sleeveless t-shirt. This game is awesome. You can actually crack a bottle on a guy's head and the shards embed in his skull. Let me see. Rick dropped into the empty chair. Jeff pressed on a series of buttons and a hulking character on the screen picked up a bottle that read XXX and cracked it over the skull of a skinny little guy drinking at the bar. Oh man, Jeff groaned. None of them stuck that time. Here, you take the other controller and I'll restart the game. Won't you have to do everything over? asked Rick. Dude, it's a bar brawl. Who cares? <clears throat> that was one of the cool things about Jeff. He didn't really care about things like high scores and winning streaks. Rick's older brother Thomas never restarted a video game to let Rick join in. In fact, sometimes he'd leave a game paused for days because he was between save points on his quest and didn't want to retrace his steps. Rick wasn't allowed to play anything on the game system until Thomas was done. Now, Rick and Jeff re-entered the game's bar. A blinking neon sign told Rick it was named The Rampage. The brawl was already going, so the two of them had to take on every hostile customer they encountered. Rick even managed to get some glass to stick it to a woman's head, which got him a mid-game high five from Jeff. They threw punches, kicks, and bottles until the room was empty and the bartender officially put their faces on the barred entry wall of fame list. Jeff checked out his window. Looked like Gene's gone. Let's go downstairs and get some soda. Jean was Jeff's dad. Stacy was nice. Jean was well. Stacy was nice anyway. Stacy appeared in the doorway of the kitchen while Jeff was pouring two large cups of orange soda. So, Rick, you excited about middle school? I guess. I have to keep reminding this one over here that it's not going to be like fifth grade. Stacy tipped her head towards Jeff. Jeff grunted. 
I know, Mom. There are going to be more responsibilities and more opportunities to get in trouble. Jeff finished Stacy's Song of the Summer. I'm glad you're aware. Now make sure you find these opportunities and avoid them. Stacy turned to Rick. You'll make sure he stays out of trouble, right? I'll try. Rick stared at the streams of bubbles in his cup, wishing this conversation weren't happening. If he had raised his eyes, he would have seen that Jeff looked at least as uncomfortable. Mom, Jeff said, this is our last day before middle school and we just want to relax. Fine, fine, said Stacy. I'm not here to give you a hard time, but if you get into trouble, you'll learn the new meaning of the word punishment. Mom, when have I ever been in trouble? You got into two fist fights last year. Yeah, but neither of them were my fault, right, Rick? Rick tried to sink into his chair. The way Jeff told it, nothing was ever his fault. And really, Jeff was right about the one kid at the park who had freaked out because he thought Jeff had stolen his bike. When it turned out, they just had the same model. But with Evan at school, it had totally been Jeff who turned it into a fight. And he'd punched a kid in fourth grade, too, though that hadn't turned out well for him. It was your bike. Rick hated lying, but he also hated having people mad at him. It was best when he could come out with a way to say the truth that left the parts of something that left out the parts someone might not want to hear. Just do your best to stay out of trouble, okay? Stacy said. I will. Come on, Rick, let's go. Jeff grabbed his soda and head for the stairs. Rick followed, glad both to get away from the conversation and that he hadn't been the one to end it. Sorry about my mom, Jeff said once they were back upstairs. I was so worried about not running into the dadder dial that I forgot about the mom octopus and the dangerous creature of the great orange soda river. Especially on the day when school starts, when the parent beasts of the suburban savannah are most likely to pounce. No kidding. So what should we play now? Jeff gestured at his pile of video games. What if we work on no homeworks, Burke? We're only 50,000 civilians from a major disaster. Rick and Jeff had been playing Virtual Town all summer, and they'd read online that once their town of No Homeworksburg reached the population of 1 million, it would be hit by either a hurricane, an earthquake, wildfire, wildfires, or Godzilla. Rick and Jeff were hoping for Godzilla. I could go for that, said Jeff. Rick smiled. He loved when Jeff approved his choices. Sometimes Rick's pictured himself as Alexander Hamilton, like in that musical that Mom loved, and Jeff was General George Washington. Not that Jeff was anything like the first United States president, but there was a song about Hamilton being his right-hand man, and sometimes Rick felt like that. Jeff wasn't a general or 25 years older than him, and he'd never crossed the Delaware River in a rowboat, but he did know how to navigate a room full of kids. And with the choppy waters of sixth grade only 17 hours away, that could be more important. Awesome, so that was the first chapter of Rick. I hope you enjoyed it. I will talk to you so very soon. Thanks for listening. Bye!